we're about to go away on a bit of a road trip, so I'm looking forward to, on a couple of nights at least, staying in motels. So the best bit about staying in motels, i found, is the Discovery Channel. It's a documentary channel, and some people have it on cable at home, but uh, for me, it's a holiday treat. You get three choices on the Discovery Channel. It's either documentaries about bridges, sharks, or Hitler, but uh, I, I enjoy watching the, especially the ones about bridges. I uh, love engineering, love great design, and about to uh, watch something like that, it gives me real confidence when I cross a bridge, knowing that the design and the construction uh, has really worked hard to make that as safe as possible. When I was a kid, I loved reading cutaway books, books that showed you the insides of a plane or a submarine or a castle. You know, normally, you only see the outside of an object like that, and the inner workings are a mystery. So I love getting behind that outer um, appearance and seeing what's really going on in things. And 2 Kings chapter 6 is one of the many chapters in the Bible that work a bit like a cutaway diagram. It gives us an insight behind what we normally see and we get to see how things really work. It's like a great bridge documentary that shows us how all these things work together. And like the best cutaway drawings, this chapter gets right to the very heart of things. In fact, it's going to give us a great insight into the character of God. And just like driving over a bridge, knowing how it's built can give us confidence. Knowing how God works in the unseen things gives us great confidence to face the challenges of life. So there are two incidents recorded in 2 Kings 6, 1 to 23. The first one covers only the first seven verses. We've come across this, an incident like this only a little while ago, back in chapter 4. It's like the death in the pot incident that we read back there. And back then it was just a sport meal. Here it's just an axe head. It's an undeniable miracle, of course, though. Iron doesn't float by itself. But it's sandwiched between Naaman being cured of leprosy and the events of the second part of the passage and their events of international significance. Also, too, the book of Kings was compiled finally during the exile, about 300 years after this event. So... What is it about this little event that struck the writer that made them want to include it? I guess, in a way, their situations were quite similar. In Elisha's time, foreign armies were raiding Israel. In the writer's time, other armies had wiped out Israel completely. And they were living as strangers in a foreign land. The thing that might have struck the writer as they thought about this incident in Elisha's life was that even though big things are happening, international events, God takes the time to look after his needy people. And again, like the death in the pot episode, we need to put this episode into context. In verse 5, we're told that the axe head was made of iron. Nothing unusual there. Most of our axe heads today are made of steel. But for it to be mentioned meant that it was something special. Archaeologists make a distinction between the Bronze Age and the Iron Age. It describes when a society transitions into the technology to begin to work with iron, which is a much tougher process than working with bronze. And this time in Israel was that transition time between the two. You know, some people had iron, particularly Israel's enemies, and many didn't. Israel seemed to be slow starters when it came to taking up this newfangled metal, iron. And so the axe was on the cutting edge of technology. And when it went to the bottom of the river, uh, the man was distraught because it was borrowed. Iron wasn't cheap. And it was still fairly hard to make. And it took up a lot of resources. So this was a pretty precious axe. You couldn't just nip down the bunnies and grab another one. You know, one writer tries to give a modern equivalent by saying if you borrowed your friend's car only to ride it off on the way home, that's the kind of distraughtness that this uh, person's feeling. The axe head could not be easily replaced and it was going to be really expensive. But as the man cried out in his distress, God heard his cry and through Elisha the axe heads recovered. God is concerned about the needs of his people. And so even with really big and really important events taking place, God is able and willing to be concerned about our personal trials. Years ago, I read a story about a missionary in Nepal, and I don't know if it's 
true or not, it's one of those kind of, one of those kind of stories, but it, it was just as World War I was breaking out and a British missionary was working in Nepal. Now, he hadn't heard about the outbreak of the war because the mail uh, doesn't come for weeks. But during that time, one of the priests of a local shrine came and told him that all their gods had left Nepal and had gone over to the missionaries' part of the world. That story always struck me for all kinds of reasons, but for the main one was that's a very different view of God than, than I was used to. And for that priest, if his God was somewhere, that meant there were places where he was not. So if that God went to Europe, and he wasn't in Nepal. And also, that war in Europe had attracted that God's attention, so things at home in Nepal weren't as important. It's as though the people of Nepal had to take a number and wait for their God to get back. But the Lord God is not like that at all. He's not restricted to a place. And while he directs the affairs of nations, he's still interested in each of his children. There aren't more important things going on around the world that God's attention is diverted so people in need in another part of the world miss out. You know, this unnamed man who lost his friend's axe head is testimony to that. But I think why it's included in the book of 2 Kings is because we need to be constantly reminded of that. When we think about God, we often equate his greatness with his bigness. In the words of Psalm 46, nations are in uproar, kingdoms fall, he lifts his voice, the earth melts. God is the ruler of nations, king of kings and lord of lords. But his greatness is also seen in his ability to know the very intimate details of our life and demonstrate ongoing care for us. How great is God? He can uh, rise, cause the rise and fall of nations. He uh, he lifts his voice and the earth melts. How great is our God? He knows the number of hairs on your head. And he cares for you. Jesus has to remind his disciples in Luke chapter 12, are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? And yet not one of them's forgotten by God. Indeed, the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. What Jesus says there and in our passage in 2 Kings opens up the cutaway drawing. Because behind and within every common activity in life, there is God at work. In fact, there's no aspect of our life, as ordinary and everyday as it might seem, where God is not present or working. Now the events of verses 1 to 7 take place in that workaday world. And so we can be going about our ordinary work as plain or as boring or sometimes even as godless as it might seem, but God is right there. We look and see a factory or an office or a workshop or a classroom or a lounge room or a hospital ward or, war, hospital ward or a shopping aisle. We see that, but a cutaway drawing of that scene reveals God at work in the people alongside you in the events and conversations of each shift or each day's work. And not even an axe head dropped in the river escapes his attention. So realising that can transform even our trip to work. You know, we're thinking about uh, what's going on, what going to have to do at work, what I've got to do today. But I can also be wondering about what, what's God going to be doing at work today? The realisation can shape our prayers. We might ask that we might be able to see what he's doing and to be part of it, to be able to get a glimpse of the cutaway and be about God's work just in, in tomorrow's day at work. Or if today's job is just getting through today, we can take courage from this passage that God is not too busy to do, be doing really big and important things out there throughout the world that he has no time for our situation. The people who first read this book could take courage because they were lost and discarded in a foreign land. 
And they can read this and they can think, wow, if God cares about a lost axe head, how much more is he concerned about his lost people? In Luke 15, Jesus drives this point home with three stories about lost things. A lost sheep, a lost coin, a lost son. And in each one, God is pictured as someone who will not give up until he's found what is lost and has safely brought it home. Perhaps you're listening today and you feel your lostness. You might be happy to know that God is great and, uh, and you know that he exists, but that he could be interested in you with what you've done. Well, that's different. But this passage shows you and I that God is interested. And Jesus himself said that he came to seek and to save what was lost. No one is outside the range of his love and compassion and mercy. And you can know the joy of a homecoming or of of lost and being found when you repent and turn away from that course you've set in life and turn back to God through Jesus. God knows our situation completely. And he's not too big to be uh, to uh, take notice or to fail to take notice of you. He's not uh, off doing other things that leave you behind. He's watching over you and he's calling you closer to himself, even in the ordinary things of life. The second cutaway we get in this chapter shows the kind of care we receive from God even when we don't realise it. The army of the king of Aram surrounded the city where the prophet Elisha is staying. and They wanted to capture and kill him. The Aramean king was sick and tired of Elisha passing on all these secret plans of attack to the king of Israel. And so he wants to get rid of Elisha, but you know, how the Aramean king thought that he could sneak up on Elisha after all that, well, I don't know, but he certainly gave it a go. And even if Elisha did know what was up, he didn't seem too concerned. When the day dawns, Elisha's servant looks out and sees the Aramean army all around the city. And then we read that this happened. Oh, my Lord, what shall we do? The servant asked. Don't be afraid, the prophet answered. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed, Oh Lord, open his eyes so he may see. And the Lord opened the servant's eyes and he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Surrounded by the angels of God, the army of angels. Elisha had the privilege of being able to see that reality that we are normally unaware of, but it is there nonetheless. Just because we can't see it doesn't mean it's not there. Now the writer to the Hebrews asks a rhetorical question in Hebrews 1 verse 14. Are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? Elijah's experience is just one occasion of many throughout the Bible where angels protect the people of God. And in fact, Hebrews says that all angels are ministering spirits, spirits sent by God to help his people. They work in response to God's concern for his people. One way that God shows his complete care of his people is through the ministry of angels. Jesus is talking about children in Matthew 18 and he says this see that you do not look down on one of these little ones for I tell you that their angels in heaven always see the face of my father in heaven seems that these children have their angels in heaven and it makes sense to say that these angels have a special role towards children And considering Satan's particular hatred of children, that's comforting news. God loves his children, sorry, God loves his people, including children. And one aspect of that love is his caring provision of angels to protect and help us. 
So it's not so much, wow, isn't it great that I've got angels looking after me? It's, wow, isn't it great that God loves us so much that he even sends his angels to care for us? And unlike Elisha, we might not always be aware of their presence. In fact, it might only be once or twice in our lives where that curtain is drawn back and we get a glimpse, even though veiled, of the ministry of angels. But people I've spoken to over the years who have been made aware of angels' ministry in their life are naturally hesitant to talk about it. It was such a special gift that to talk about it almost cheapens it. Well, there's always the fear that they won't be believed. And very often their ministry is private. And I think much of the ministry of angels goes unreported because it is so intensely powerful and personal. A special gift from God given at a time of great distress or need. Psalm 91 shows us God's reason for sending angels as ministering spirits. Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him, for he acknowledges my name. He will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. Because God loves his people dearly, he sends his angels to care for us. And so we can't divorce the ministry of angels from the expression of God's care. What does Hebrews say? They're ministering spirits sent by God. They're sent by God, but they are sent to whom? Those who will inherit salvation. Those who belong to God. Those who have made the Most High their dwelling. Those who love him. So it's the sole and precious privilege of the Christian to receive the ministry of God's mighty angels. A special aspect, and, and one aspect, of God's complete care for us. Elisha's servant had the privilege of having his eyes open to see that ongoing mighty care. But even if we're unaware of their ministry, what does that tell us about God? It shows how much God cares for his people, that he loves each one of his children deeply. He knows their needs knows when they're in danger, knows when they're distressed. And as an expression of that great love and compassion, he sends his angels to minister to his children. Jesus experienced that ministry in the Garden of Gethsemane as he was preparing to demonstrate the greatest expression of God's love for his people. The ministry of angels always points us to God. And as wonderful as they are, and as wonderful as their ministry is, none of them have laid down their lives for us. Only the beloved Son of God has done that. These two scenes in Two Kings here remind us of God's ongoing, constant, gracious care to each of his children. And he does that whether we see it or not. How about I pray and uh, ask God for eyes to see what he's doing in our lives. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your complete care of each one of us. And we all have a testimony for the way that you've shown your goodness and care to us in all different kinds of situations, some almost sort of trivial, like the axe head, others when we've been in moments of great peril and distress. But it's such a comfort to us to know that you are with us in both those kinds of occasions. Going about our daily work, you're there. Well, going about our daily work, you've already been there, preparing that day for us. Help us to see what you're doing uh, in our chores and routines and paid work and family responsibilities uh, and our uh, service to the community. And may we be have may you open our eyes to see the way that you're working and how we can get involved in that. And thank you for the way that when things go wrong. <laughs> that you, you are there and you have compassion, that you're not too busy leading and directing and guiding the nations, but you also have a compassionate care for the, even the smallest of your children. And we thank you too for the ministry of angels that's so unseen most of the time. Thank you for the way that you, it almost seems like an infinite way that you care for us, and angels is a particularly special and important way. We thank you for that. But thank you that their ministry 
speaks of your concern and compassion for us. So Father, thank you for the way that you, you work in our lives and you protect us and help us even when we just sort of blunder through a day and are just totally unaware of it. Thank you for your mercy to us there. But we would pray for eyes to see these things. Lord, we want to uh, be able to be on the lookout for what you're doing, quick to be able to say thank you and to uh, show our gratitude and joy uh, in you. And Father, while we aren't angels, may you direct us into the paths of people who need a special ministry even this week. May we share some of the great concern and care that you've shown us. We share that with others. Because we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.